Hello everyone, my name is Josh and welcome to Whims. And today I'm going to be giving you my review for A Nightmare on Elm Street. Released in 1984 and starring Robert England, Heather Lane Camp and a very young Johnny Depp and written and directed by Wes Craven who up until this point he had mostly made a name for himself directing films like Last House on the Left and The Hills Have Eyes. Wes Craven wanted to go somewhere a little bit different for his next project. He basically came up with the idea of A Nightmare on Elm Street when he was going through several articles of children in various different places but mostly in I think a camping career who were terrified to go to sleep and when um, one a particular person was found victim to this he had various different um, neck injuries and various things like that but they didn't know quite what the cause of death was it was more like a sense of he had been screaming and he was very much on edge and he was you know tearing things apart in his room but by the time they got to him he was dead and that was basically the general story of what A Nightmare on Elm Street came into being and the story basically follows a group of children in or a group of teenagers in this case um, who are being picked off one by one and they are essentially having these very strange nightmares of one singular individual by the name of Freddy Krueger. <clears throat> and Freddy Krueger, as the story goes, he was a um, very, very low-rent um, individual, very low-profile person, but he basically worked in a boiler room, and he was essentially taking the local kids of Springwood and basically taking them back to his um, boiler room to essentially kill them. And he would have this special gloved like um, appendage that had like um, rusty metal blades on them that he would use to basically kill his victims with. And the parents essentially caught wind of this and they tried to essentially burn down his boiler room with him in it and they thought they killed him. But then, of course, some th as these things often do, they ended up, you know, creating a much more powerful entity in Freddy Krueger, this person who essentially goes into people's dreams to essentially kill them. And what I really like about this film, <clears throat> aside from the general setup of there being the, just the serial killer that comes after you in your dreams, and of course that creating a horror icon in Freddy Krueger, Ro um, Robert England's Freddy Krueger portrayal, but what I really like about this concept is it came from a supposedly real story. The fact that that one article that Wes Craven wrote about these teenagers who were terrified to go to sleep and that one case of one teenager being dead, even though technically there was no physical bruising on him or anything like that to indicate that he had been harmed in any way or there was any self-harm going on. It really goes to show that Wes Craven put a lot of thought into this and the idea just came to him like that. And I really do like the fact that Wes Craven does think about these things and when he goes into the inspiration for his films, he does like to go into a more psychological perspective. Like, he is thinking more about what the story is going to be about, by and large. What is he trying to do by making this film? What's he saying about the world that he's talking about? He's kind of in the same school of director as someone like Wes Craven, where he is thinking about what are the social, what are the, you know, more broader aspects of this topic that I can talk about. And even though A Nightmare on Elm Street is a story about a bunch of teenagers running away from a killer, whilst also being incredibly horny, this film is also an interesting, you know, just exploration of atmosphere. And I really do like the fact that in a good portion of this film, well, actually the first couple of... The, the first um, 50 minutes of the film, you're mostly following one character, and her name is Tina, and she is a um, up and coming high schooler. She's sort of like someone who who likes to keep her head down, likes to you know get work done. And she's very you know popular. And she has you know a group of friends by the name of Nancy and uh, Glenn, her boyfriend Glenn, and um, Tina's boyfriend Rod. And I really do like the fact that she is just this person who just wants to mind her own business. Um, she has had a very difficult home life. Her father left years ago and her mother has essentially got around, you know, various different places. From what we hear of her, she goes to Las Vegas one time with this boyfriend of hers and she basically is left on her own. And that's really quite sad. But one night she has a horrible dream where she is um, in a very dank and very dark um, boiler room where she encounters the... Fr 
Freddy Krueger himself, and she's able to wake up and get out of it okay. A, and then she goes to school the next day and she tells her friend Nancy Thompson, played by Heather Langenkamp, about the dream, and Glenn overhears the, about the dream and about the person in the dream, and that creates a whole entire you know connection that no one tells each other about, or at least um, Glenn and um, Tina and Heather don't tell each other about it, or at least they don't tell each other to a certain extent. But what's very interesting is that when this happens you're basically led to believe that Tina's the protagonist, that she is the main, you know, girl, she's the main final girl, she's the one who's going to make it out okay. And what I really like is that they all decide to go round her house at the very start of the film, and they keep an eye on her, they're having a lot of fun, there's this really fun gag where um, Glenn has a radio playing and he phones his mum, or his mum phones him on the landline, and he's basically saying, oh, I'm just, you know, studying, I'm just, you know... I'm sitting back with a couple of friends and a couple of beers and then um, the window's open and or he, he likes to pretend that the window's open he's just looking out the window getting some fresh air and then all of a sudden he's like playing this radio and then all of a sudden these very weird sound effects like stock sound effects like explosions and people shouting and calling back names and all sorts of things and he's like going oh yeah there seems to be an argument going on and it keeps going and keeps going until he eventually tries to figure out well how am I going to stop it how am I going to switch it off and that was such a really fun scene it was a great way of releasing some of the tension that was already established in the film early on but it, it doesn't do it in a way that's distracting or messes with the tone it manages to feel like a very sweet and very authentic moment that just adds levity i suppose you could say to the overall film but what i really like is that when when this is set up has happened where you are introduced to tina and you meet her friends and you spend a little, little bit of time with her you really do think at first she is going to be the the main character she's the character that we're going to follow for a good portion of the film and then when it's revealed that you know she has a boyfriend named rod who's a bit of a bad boy um, they go up to her room and Glenn and uh, Glenn and Nancy decide to, you know, stay downstairs. He sleeps on the sofa and she sleeps in another bedroom. Um, that's when Rod and Tina decide to have sex. And usually in horror, that's usually a telltale sign that you're going to die. Like you're going to be one of the first to die. And that's one of those things, even if you weren't genre aware, you knew that that kind of her having sex with her boyfriend was going to be something of a death sentence almost, because that's always the case with these slasher films or these sort of, you know, horror films surrounding teenagers. They always have this role that if you're a virgin, you're bound to live kind of thing. And that's kind of very upsetting. But for the most part, um, it's done very successfully. But what I really think is interesting is that when she dies, I think Tina's death scene is probably one of my favourite um, horror death scenes because of how brutally real it is. And it doesn't feel like, you know, it doesn't feel like um, Freddy Krueger in the later sequels where he'll say something like, bon appetit, bitch, or something like that. Or he'll say something very, you know, sassy or he'd say a one-liner like, um, how's this for a wet dream? And... He goes, welcome to prime time, bitch, or anything like that. Like he, do he, he doesn't say, you know, these quick, witty one-liners. In fact, he kind of, you know, just basically taunts Tina. Like when she first encounters him, she's going outside to the back alley and um, sort of like the backyard, and she goes through a fencing area, like a door in the fencing area, and she sees Freddy Krueger, you know, approaching her with those long arms and that razor claw, like that glove, you know, just scraping across the metal and she's like going, please, God. And he does that very wonderful thing where he goes, this is God. And it really is a great introduction to his character because this is the first time that we see Freddy in the flesh. We see him, you know, basically in all his glory, very kind of damp looking Christmas sweater and all and that lovely, love you know, fedora hat, you know, that he wears. And um, we see him in all his glory and we see him basically running in a rather kind of goofy way up the alleyway towards her. And what's really weird is it could be seen as rather ridiculous. In fact, a lot of people could say this entire franchise or this entire, you know, concept is ridiculous. But what Wes Craven does so well is they focus on Tina and her basically trying to get away from from uh, from from Freddy. But when we um when he catches up to her and he, you know, does that thing where he goes, hey, Tina, watch this. And he does that thing with the gloves where he takes two of his fingers off and the green goo or the blood is sort of like spurting out. And he, like, gives that little little, uh, little look to her every once in a while. Like, 
you could always tell that that's where Art the Clown came from, from the Terrifier films, that the idea that he would basically, you know, do that sort of glare, like very kind of happy little sadistic glare, and he'd be looking at his deformed hand and things like that. I think it's those eyes that really make it work. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's really creepy. And then, of course, she gets um, she gets grabbed by him and he, like, you know, pushes her over a, a barrel of bins and she's trying to fight him off and then she just sort of grabs his face and then his face comes off and it reveals that skeleton. And then she very brutally dies in a fashion that feels like the actress who plays Tina deserves an Oscar because, honestly, this death scene is so chilling. She makes it work because of the screams. She makes it sound like she's going through the worst pain imaginable. And it's probably one of the best death scenes ever put on film because it really does feel like she really is selling the idea that she's going through physical pain. But then, of course, she's also selling the fact that she can't do anything to sort of, you know, prove that she's actually going through something. Like, yes, she can scream to her boyfriend that she's actually in pain and in peril, but in reality, what's that going to do? All it's going to do is just basically make him even more confused and think, what the hell's going on? So when uh, Freddy kills Tina, that creates an entire, you know, launch pad of all these different things to happen. And Rod escapes, thinking that people are going to blame him for the murder, but that just makes him more guilty when he leaves the premises. And... Um, Nancy is absolutely beside herself with grief and guilt. She says to her mum, we came over to her house because she didn't want to sleep on her own, because she's there on her own. She's not with her mum or anything like that. She doesn't have anyone with her. She doesn't have her dad. Her dad left her years ago. So she did feel like she just didn't want to sleep alone. And it's a really good performance from Heather Langenkamp in that moment, like the idea that she's not only having to tell her parents that I'm grieving for my best friend, but also she had to, she literally felt that she, had, she felt that she had to explain what was going on and that really is one of those things where it really does sell the fact that yes this premise might seem goofy to a lot of people but it is played very realistically and it is played on a much more grounded level and what I really like about this film is when the dream sequences happen it's done in a way where you don't know you're in a dream at first where these characters are on their own or they're maybe just doing something and then something weird will very slowly creep up in the corner of their eye and they'll think to themselves what was that and then of course it slowly builds to eventually reveal oh yes freddy krueger shows up and that's when all the chaos happens but what i really like in the original is they give you little clues to hint that this is a dream or that this is a dream and what they do is they include smoke smoke filters into the room that's why i noticed when i was because i was watching this film on the big screen i watched it actually last night with a friend of mine who I, who I go to the cinema with every once in a while, but he saw it for the first time. And I've seen this film plenty of times before, and I will no doubt see this film many more times afterwards. But during this particular viewing, I really did notice that there was a lot of smoke in the scenes where, you know, that the, the moment of reality would cease to exist when the characters were in the dream. That's more specific in the scene during the bathtub where he puts his hands up and he's about to reach for Nan Nancy but then he sort of like brings his hand down when um, the knock at the door happens and she wakes up during that scene yes you could say that the steam's coming from the bath but then at the same time there's also steam coming whenever you know um, Tina goes out into the backyard to you know check what the noise is or anything like that like, like, like smoke is almost like an elemental thing but the way it's utilised in the dream sequences it makes it realise that oh yes the steam's coming here because, you know, that's the boiler room, that's where he killed his victims. And I thought that was such a very clever detail. It's a very subtle detail that you would miss if you, you know, didn't actually pay attention. But it's one of those things that I noticed where I was watching it on the big screen. Like, yeah, there's smoke drifting in whenever they're in the dream. And I thought that was actually a very clever detail. And it really goes to show that even though they are basically in California or somewhere with palm trees you do get the impression that, yes, this is a very foggy um, landscape, but that's not because, you know, it's naturally foggy or it's atmospheric, like, you know, a countryside in England. It's more like, you know, that's actually a motif that Freddy Krueger uses to lure people in because that's him in the steam room luring the children into, you know, the in, into their doom. So when Heather decides to figure out what's going on and try to get to know um, what happened, she tries to visit um, Rod, but he basically says... Um, I I was actually there, but I couldn't do anything. She was absolutely gutted on the ceiling. He was like, you know, dragging her around a bit, and she doesn't believe it at first. But she does try to hold on to the hope that he is innocent and that Freddy Krueger was involved. 
And throughout most of the film, she is basically just trying to not fall asleep. She drinks as much coffee as possible. And there was a moment where, you know, Rod dies by um, getting hung in his uh, prison cell by Freddy Krueger. And um, there was also a moment where um, the mum goes to go and take Nancy to um, the psychiatric institute where they can perform tests on her. And it's during the sequence, it's probably the only time in the film where we see a nightmare sequence told from the real world perspective. Because usually when we go into the dreams of the Nightmare on Elm Street universe, it's always from the dreamer's point of view. Whereas this is probably the only time in the film franchise where we see it from the real world perspective. And that I think is very interesting because not only do we see what she's going through, she's staying put and she starts to cough and convulse and gag and things like that but then of course when she is screaming they try to wake her up and when she is woken up she retrieves Freddy's hat from off his head and that's when we get the backstory about Freddy Krueger and how he was basically a local you know janitor who sent you know um who lured children to their deaths by taking him to their boy to his boiler room and things like that and um Nancy tries to again try to figure out what where Freddy Krueger is how she can get him out through her dream because if she can get the hat out if she grabs hold of him and she wakes up at a certain point she can bring him out of the the um out of the dream into the real world so by doing that she basically is taking back some of the power that she lost by you know being in fear of Freddy Krueger so that's sort of the thing that they need to do. So she tries to do it once in, in, in a previous scene before Rod dies, and it doesn't work uh, because she gets sidetracked by, you know, Rod and, uh, and witnessing his death. But then she tries it again, and she ends up, you know, also um, worried because not only was this did this happen after her boyfriend Glenn dies in a very horrific fashion where he gets pulled underneath his mattress and into a fountain of blood just sort of spurs up from the from the bed but also she feels like she's going crazy she feels like she's lost everything but she's going to try her best to try to make sure that she avenges all of her friends and all of her family for what he's done to them and it's a very entertaining sequence where she basically sets up booby traps and anti-personnel devices which is actually a really funny sequence and i like the fact that um when glenn when they're you know out during the day they're like having lunch together and he just basically says oh what book are you reading and he reads the title and he goes what are you reading that for (laughs) Or, and then she just goes, I need to find him, I need to be prepared. And then, in, and then he just says, as she's about to leave, he, she says, I've got to go, I'll see you later. And he goes, you're starting to scare me. <laughs> and there's even this, I, I have to say, I just love Glenn from, uh, I, I just love Glenn in this film. Not only is he played by the absolute gorgeous Johnny Depp, um, but he is also really adorable in this film. Like There's a moment where... Um, where she's talking to him on the phone just before he dies, actually. And he goes, um, she goes, if nothing happens and I fail at this, then you guys can all relax because I'm just being nuts. And he goes, well, if you want my opinion, I think you're as nutty as a fruitcake. I still love you, though, and I really love that. The way he says that was just so adorable, and I thought, oh, no, he's going to (laughs) die. Aye, that's literally like, when you say I love you in a slasher film, that's like saying, you know, I'm a few days away from retirement, or I'm a day away from retirement. That's literally like inviting the killer to kill you. <laughs> like That's like cussing yourself in an open ocean and a, and a shark comes kind of thing. That's what that's about. But yeah, poor Glenn dies, and um, he dies in a very horrific fashion. And that's when Tina, you know, does the, the, the dream thing, where she tries to go into the dream and get Freddy. And when she does, um, she creates these, these booby traps and these um, special devices that she can use to fight back against him. But what's very good is that she is very aware of the fact that she could potentially die, but she's absolutely fearless and she shows absolute, you know, integrity and bravery throughout the course of this sequence. And it is also really funny as well, the fact that he very quickly, you know, just gets overpowered in such a big way. But it's very atmospheric, very well done. And I feel like this film is a classic for a reason. There are a couple of moments where I found that, yeah, the acting wasn't all that great, especially from the actor who played Rod. I feel like he was one of the actors who felt like, ooh, he could have read that line a little bit better, or they could have done a retake on that bit. 
But everyone else, Johnny Depp and Heather Langenkamp, were really good. The actress who played Tina, that scream alone when she dies is absolutely Oscar worthy. That 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 moment was absolutely sold to me that she was in extreme pain and she was being tortured. But what's really amazing about this film is it created an entire legacy of sequels and it really is he, he, he became one of the ultimate horror icons but what's really great about Nightmare on Elm Street is it will always have a special place in a lot of horror fans hearts because it created Freddy Krueger and it not only created Freddy Krueger but it created New Line Cinemas and or New Line Cinema the production company behind the Nightmare on Elm Street films and they went on to do other you know big franchises not all of them horror related but they are they, they are most certainly you know a, a, a production studio that's been around for a long time they produce the um lord of the rings films as well so you really do get this impression that they create an entire legacy of not just a horror icon but also a production studio that's is still going to this day and it really is incredible but what's really wonderful is that wes craven created this. so not only did he create a wonderful iconic um, serial killer and you know character and series in the 90s with Scream but he also did it again uh, did it before with you know Nightmare on Elm Street and if you want to go even back even further he did you know films like The Serpent and the Rainbow, The People Under the Stairs, like I said Last House on the Left and um, and you know um, um, The Hills Have Eyes but that those films were more exploitation films where they were trying to capitalise on the, the 70s trend of doing you know very exploitation heavy films but with at least one of them he was at least trying to say something about you know when push comes to shove who are the real monsters is it the people who are fighting back or the people who are attacking them it's like the natural predators versus the prey how much of it is is you know genuine how much of society remains when you are attacked or threatened how much of your humanity remains when you are literally facing the prospect of you and your family potentially dying how much of your you know inner lion will come out during these very horrific circumstances that was hills have eyes for all the people so i feel that that's something that he does very well he's very good at finding the meat and potatoes or the intellectual meat and potatoes of a film when it comes to um looking at a concept and really kind of say what can we say about this what can we say about these survivors and this scenario that they're in and it's kind of the same with nightmare on elm street whereas of course with with a lot of teenagers they are often in their own little worlds already where they are literally connecting with people they're socializing they're developing relationships getting romantic doing all sorts of things trying different things experimenting and a lot of the old generation a lot of the parents don't get it and they don't often they don't often complain or get any kind of you know sass if they don't pry and they don't try to burst in on all of it and it feels like when you do that you are sometimes risking a lot when it comes to those sorts of things because you don't know what your children are getting up to and that can make it really unsafe and really unpredictable so i think what this film does is it really kind of shows that communication is key and it's almost like a, a an online social networking anti-bullying cyberbullying kind of thing where it's like um you need to communicate otherwise this horrible thing Thing could happen but except instead of computers it's a dream monster or it's a dream boogeyman kind of thing and that i think is very compelling but this film is absolutely fantastic i've seen it many times before but the what inspired me to do this review was that i went to go and see it with a friend of mine bradley he'd actually not seen it before but i'd seen it multiple times and he really enjoyed it and i really do think it's an incredible film to watch on the big screen i really had a good time anyway so it was a really good experience and i liked hearing his feedback and what he thought of the film as well because he again he hadn't seen it before so when um i went to go see it, it was a it was a it was a thursday night it was just it was a wednesday night excuse me it was just yesterday and we went to go and see the film at 8.40 in the Omniplex in Sutton. And we actually um, ha ha had a bit of a dinner beforehand. And we actually you know, just chatted for a while before the film you know, started. And then we went to go and see the film. And we both enjoyed it. We were both sitting down in the sort of bottom row, the disabled section. And it was one of those moments where um, we actually were, for the longest time, in an empty cinema. But then as the film started up and as the previews and the commercials were coming in, um, people started to flood in gradually one by one and claim their seats and then when the film got started it was very quick and it flew by honestly I did I didn't know it was this quick and I really did feel like the 
the the actual atmosphere was very good and again i noticed certain things upon my watching on the big screen like the fact that you know smoke filters in whenever you know that they're in a dream i thought that was a very interesting detail but it was a really good time and i had a lot of fun and i'll be going out with my friend bradley again tomorrow night to do my stand-up comedy and i'll also be you know going to go and see a film with him called heretic with um, hugh grant which i'm really looking forward to seeing but yeah that's my review for um a nightmare on elm street and if you like this video please be sure to give it a thumbs up and if you um like this video and you want to see more please subscribe for more videos and look forward to my review later on this evening for the halloween films the first two halloween films um for my double feature i hope you're all having a very good day take care bye for now